Ahora presentamos a Chandra de Barconda, Financial Services, Data and Analytics Executive Director para EY Américas, quien encabeza la conferencia Business Data Fabric, a Modern Data and Analytics Architecture to Drive Transformation. Right. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining this session on Data Fabric. Uh, my name is Chandra Devarkunda. I'm a managing director in the analytics practice in the financial services in North America. Um, today, we'll talk about the new and emerging trend um, in what we call the data fabric and, and the reasons why an approach taking the data fabric and the, the technology behind it is, is why it's shaping up in terms of large scale financial services organizations and solving a lot of their data management problems. The reason for the evolution of the data fabric is that today with large scale and newer sources of data, both structured data, semi-structured data, and as well as unstructured data coming into organizations is having organizations determine how you best manage data at the source. At the same time, there are a number of other newer technologies emerging that are solving for specific areas in terms of metadata, data quality, data pipelines, um, data security, data privacy, and so forth. So how does one manage all of the different types of data? as well as these different types of services solving these specific problems. And therein comes in the data fabric. So today I will go do an overview of what the data fabric really means from a business standpoint. And, and from there, I will walk you through some of the key components of what the fabric means and what constitutes a fabric. And then we will take a, one or two use cases and look at how we are applying data fabric in the marketplace, in the real world. So as I said at the start, it's an emerging technology integrating different data systems. So today, if you look at any financial institution, as an example, some of their data platforms have been traditionally built on premise. They have been having mainframe systems, they have on-premise data lakes. Um, in the past few years, there have been a huge growth in terms of a data lake or a next generation data warehouse. At the same time, there are also growing needs for rapid analytics because there's, given that there's more data, customers of these financial institutions are having more choices. They have newer digital channels that they are able to use to quickly determine what is the best service that they should be getting. And how do they get the service from financial institution from one financial institution to another? And they're able to, their switching costs have reduced. They're able to switch from one, from one bank to another bank, from one insurance company to another insurance company. So how do you make sure that these institutions can increase the stickiness of the customer by understanding the customer better, by being more responsive, by providing more customer experience, a better customer experience at the point of contact for the customer. And at the same time, providing the trust in terms of that interaction so that the customer is able to feel that their data is is trusted, they can share their, their personal data with the financial institution and not be afraid of a breach in privacy, of a breach in security, and get the services that they're looking for from the institution. So in order to do that, while the, at the same time, the institution, the client, the, the bank or the insurance company is having to deal with a lot of this data coming from the various customer digital channels, coming from um, you know, diff different third-party sources, also from as their internal systems are growing and their business models are changing, 
they're getting a lot of data even from the internal systems. So how does the chief data officer or the data, the data organization of a financial um, institution manage all of this data together in a manner that is automated, in a manner that introduces newer ways and quicker ways of responding to the customer, of newer ways of gathering the data, bringing them together, and building those insights. So to take a step back, for all these years, we've had not only in financial institutions, but also in other types of businesses, we've had ERP systems, we've had on-premise mainframe systems, we've had relational database transactional systems, we've had data mods and, and so forth. So rather than trying to reinvent something new, is there a way to stitch them together using new technology? Is there a way to bring them together and understand these systems better in a much faster manner? And as it happens, there is a better way. And that better way is what we are calling the FI. Some, what are the, some of the use cases one can ask? Say, okay, great. So data fabric can solve, can bring the data together these across these different systems. I'm going to the public cloud. I have systems on my on-premise mainframe data systems and Hadoop systems. How do I bring them together? What is, and what will it solve for me in terms of use cases? Because my clients, my customers, are using IoT um, systems. They're also using um, different types of digital devices. How do I make sure that data is really um, being integrated and solving for? So what are the, some of those use cases? If you look at the use cases, fundamentally, I'll take managing these multiple hybrid environments, solving for that in a manner so that as new technology continues to come in and data organizations continue to adopt new technology, they are not being disrupted by this technology. They are able to easily plug in new technology into their environment. They're able to understand the data sources come from this environment and not be disrupted by it, right? Not to be slowed down by it. The second thing is what I call network effects. What does that mean? As data organizations, as large scale financial organizations continue to grow and, and work with their, their business partners. So for example, you'll see later in the use case, we have a financial institution serving telecom provider. How do we make sure that the telecom provider gets the data they need from the financial institution or the other way around in a, in, um, in a seamless manner? Previously, we had to do a lot of in manual automate as uh, manual systems would have to export the data, send it over the wire and have the other institution, the business partner ingest that data, interpret what that means and then be able to make decisions. That used to take a lot of time. Today we have methods and um, technology that allows for instant data sharing, instant curated data sharing. And what that is allowing us is across the supply chain of data. So from the data originator to the business partner and to their business partners, we are able to share instantly what does which, whichever data that they would like to share in a curated form so that the consumers can, on a click of a button, can look at that curated data in a, in a way that is allowed for them through secured means and also with infusion of privacy into their, um, into their uh, data sharing platforms. So that's a second use case. And the third use case we are seeing uh, rapid growth is in terms of enabling real-time decision-making. We have always talked about real-time decision-making over the years when it came to big data, when it came to Hadoop type um, premise data platforms. But that ideal state of being real-time has been for, for many, many years 
still an ideal state, but not a real, realizable state. We were always near real time. And that near real time was also in minutes. Coming to fractions of seconds has been very, very, very hard to achieve unless the businesses were internet built, digitally built, such as some, a lot of the big global online firms. Uh, but if to achieve uh, complete real-time fraud detection, real-time customer service, real-time cross-channel interaction across, for customers across digital, digital channels has always been the ideal state. But now because of more and more infusion of digital technology, usage of things such as microservices, artificial intelligence capabilities, recommender engines that are now more tuned to run in real time, we are able to come much closer than ever before. So that's yet another use case and that is then impacting the customer experience and therefore their, their stickiness to stay with the financial institution. So that's yet another use case um, in terms of data management that we are doing and where the data fabric plays itself. So I've given some background in terms of what the data fabric is and how it's used. Let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper. Let's look at what are the components that make up a data fabric. And there is a lot of technology Microservices is one term that gets shared and thrown around pretty um, often. And it's not always microservices that solves it. So what, what is really the technology or the key building blocks that make up a data fabric? One thing that never changes is consumption, right? So end users, whether it's your digital your chat bots, your, your robots at the end of your, uh, in, right at the point of interaction with your customer, talking to the customer, or it is the customer themselves making queries and asking questions. Where is my, um, the check I should be receiving today? Where is, what is my uh, balance in my bank today after having made the transfer, right? So those questions are never going away. So while that stays static, how we respond to, how we anticipate and respond to that have been continuously changing and are now getting closer because of the data fabric to, to more realistic realization. So what's the first component? The first component that makes up a data fabric on the consumption side is virtualization. Now the term data virtualization has also been around for decades. It's not new. But how we do virtualization has changed. Initially, we would have one layer that would just connect to different data sources. But it would not cache the data. It would not understand the metadata between the two different sources and try to bring them together. It would not do this in real time. It would not maintain that data for, for a long time and it would not apply security and privacy policies in real time. Today, the virtualization technologies have come a long way. I can now use not just connecting to data sources. I, these data sources have different data structures. Some have relational structures. Some are binary data formats, such as Avro and Parquet. Some are built in hype in in a proprietary hybrid columnar structures. Take Snowflake, for instance, they have what is called a PAX data structure. And AWS have their own data structures. And so each platform have their own Azure, as some, some of its data bases have their own data structures. Yet, how can we make sure that even if our client, a financial institution adopts an AWS platform, an Azure platform, has an Hadoop platform, also has the traditional relational data structures. We make sure that the consumer, the end user, is not having to be uh, beholden 
by those platforms, that they are abstracted away from those platforms and they can only have to uh, you know, bother about the type of question that they want to ask, whether it's a chatbot or an end user, they can just simply specify, this is the question I want to ask and they ask it in their natural language. And once that question is asked, it doesn't matter where the data is actually residing, doesn't matter what structure is residing, the answer comes back instantly. So it is that virtualization capability that, and the advances in virtualization that is solving for one component of the data fabric. The second component, and we'll get into a little bit more in, in terms of each of these components. The second component is discovery of data. Right? New data sources come on. How do I know what the metadata of the new source is? And as that new source doesn't come one time, it comes repeatedly. It comes you know, in, in streams. It comes in daily batches. It comes sporadically it comes maybe you know once it comes we get a, a file today and another file two weeks later third file comes in an hour after that and the fourth file comes a month later and the data structures could have changed how do we make sure that we understand what that metadata that describes the data is and marry that metadata with the metadata that we already have so that the end user again is not having to think about, oh, how, what does this metadata mean and how is it tied to what I already have? And nor are the data management organizations having to figure that out manually and trying to stitch them together. That takes time. So today we are seeing a growth in terms of using fingerprinting and, and data digital fingerprints to better understand changes in data and tie them together using AI-based techniques. And we are able to do some of those AI-based things in, in a much faster fashion than we, were, we, we could before. So AI-based discovery of newer data sources and changes to data sources is another trend that we are able to catch on. A third trend is, is, is an absolute, absolute vital I have it at number three. It's not in terms of rank, but it it's becomes the heart of, of data fabric. And what that is, is it is the, um, the, the understanding of tying together the, meta, the technical metadata to the business metadata, to what the actual business model is. So a financial institution has an ontology the terms in terms of what a deposit means, what a check means, what does a, you know, a payment mean, those are not changing, right? That's the, that's the business model. But the sources of data are changing and you have, we are getting newer and newer data sources. And so what happens with that is we need to be able to consistently and rapidly tie the technical meta, metadata to the actual business metadata. And secondly, we are able to look at, so sometimes the technical metadata is not available or we need to refine the business metadata based on the data we have seen. So we get a new data stream, we need to understand the data stream and then change, update the definitions of the business metadata. So how do we learn from the data stream and apply that learning onto the business metadata. So that's that linkage is a key to building not a one-time ontology, but a consistent ontology over time. So that's the uh, core component that makes up a data fabric. And then there are other components. Uh, say security is absolutely key. And now when I mean by security, it's not just the authorization and authentication. It's not just a role-based access control, but how to make sure that any actor based on their role, but also based on their time, the time, their geographic location, and their context, most importantly is the context, 
is when I can allow that actor, that user to access a certain type of data. A lot of times we talk about fine-grained access control. But fine-grained has multiple definitions. The basic definition we've always dealt with as, as data practitioners is that I can do row-level control. I can do column-level control. I can make sure users, based on their role, can only see certain fields and certain columns. But to refine that even further, to say, even though the user has access to a certain data set or to a certain column, based on the time of the day or where they are located geographically or the context, the reason when, when they are accessing that data, I can determine the context and then allow or prevent the access to that data. That's a lot more powerful than just saying column level access control. So that becomes another core piece of the fab. So in this way, no matter how, how big the, the financial client, the, the institution is getting in terms of newer data sources and newer data platforms, this layer through which the users will always access is always kept at that, at that fine um, layer so that they're not prevented from accessing the data they need but also they're able to continuously prevent, you know, um, uh, the context, uh, not the uh, queries that are not in context or not in the right time or not in the right place and so forth. So it's, it's that multi-layered security that gets a lot more deeper and we are also able to upload newer privacy policies. When I speak about privacy policies, like we say here, we are saying digital privacy policies. What does that mean? In a lot of times, we apply privacy because we know sensitive data. We know that this is a social security number, this is their birth date, this is their salary, and we need to apply some privacy masking policies. But again, even if I don't know as a if as a bad actor, if somebody comes in, and even if they don't know. So the user, customers, uh, date of birth, their, their address location, they could use a lower non-sensitive data element, lesser sensitive data elements to put it together and determine more private information about the customer. And that is equally dangerous. And so today, advances on the cloud platforms as well as advances in, in terms of um, applying privacy policies in, in, uh, in, the in, the in the data platforms, we're able to use data fabric oriented approaches to apply such policies consistently across different data stores. So that's the, the other side to security is, that, is the privacy portion and how do we solve for that using data fabric. Finally, from a, from a building block standpoint, is the governance here. is making sure that not just security, privacy, metadata, but I'm able to apply a quality consistently. I'm able to lower or increase the levels of data quality based on the need. For example, the marketing user we have typically seen in, in, a, in, a, in a bank or would like to do approximate calculations. They don't need accurate payment data down to the second decimal, third decimal value. The financial reports require that value. So those require a higher quality of the same data than, than the marketers who are trying to do customer segmentation. So it, it could vary based on usage, based on the type of user. And can we provide those levers to up and down or change the levels of quality based on consumption patterns? And that's that's part of that becomes part of the governance. So as you see, there are several types of building blocks that make up what a data fabric is. From a consumption standpoint, we talked about virtualization. We talked about 
the automatic discovery of new data. We also talked about security and privacy. We talked about um, the different types of linkages of metadata. We also talked about governance from a quality standpoint and security and privacy. How do, what, what underpins all of these in terms of actual technology? So if I'm implementing this physically at a client, what am I doing? Yes, the broad big answer is building container-based solutions, absolutely. Yes, using microservices, yes, absolutely, because a lot of today's cloud platforms are allowing that. I could do private cloud, public cloud, I could build these solutions. But the important thing is I'm able to build them in a way that I don't have to make them locked in to any specific platform, to any specific technology, to any specific um, data type, data structure or data type. And that opens up the doors as a practitioner to say, for me to implement this, it's a lot easier today because of the advent and more maturing of not just container management technologies and microservices, but the ability to stitch them together across the data platforms. I mean, as an example, as Google and Anthos is allowing for some of that, as in just as an example. As another example, I could use Kubernetes and I could build out these clusters and I could share across different um, types of platforms. Yes, but it's not, it's not as easy as it is said. There is still technologies, but those are getting fewer and easier to solve for than we could do ever before. Clear, right? So with that as the as the basic background, I will now go in a, into a little bit more detail in some of the um, the key themes across these, and and then we'll get into a use case to see how this comes comes um, alive. Um, so as an example. Um, so let's take semantic data layer, right? I'm, I don't necessarily have to get into all of them, but this semantic data layer is the, the most important. Like I said before, the metadata and stitching that metadata with a business ontology makes this data fabric a lot more powerful than we could achieve from a data lake or a data warehouse that we had before. Previously, we had to stitch them together. So I onboard the data into a data lake, and then I have to build a data model that solves a certain consumption pattern. But then I'm, I'm tied to a certain type of file system, a certain type of data structure. It doesn't still free me up to accommodate any type of data structure that is there today or that will come tomorrow. And that's, that's the difference, number one. Number two, I'm able to not only build an effective intelligent tagging strategy so that as data comes in, I'm able to tag the metadata, not just about simplistic tagging, but using AI to then say, okay, I get a new element. It, it means it has a certain metadata to it. The distribution of those data values seems equivalent to what I already have. And what I already have is tied to a known ontology, a known meaning, a business meaning, which means that logically, to be able to tie the new data elements, the di distribution of those new data values to the existing data values, to the business meaning that I have in my current ontology, and then, use the metadata that came with those new data streams to update my ontology if needed based on the distribution patterns. And that is supremely powerful. And if I could do all of that automated, and if I could not tie it to any platform, and if I am doing this upfront as a metadata, as like the first thing that I'm solving for, rather than waiting, to onboard all this data and then, then figuring out what to do, it will take me a more consistent ability to 
not only understand the current data, but also tied to future data streams that will be coming down the pipe later on. So that semantic data layer and the ontologies tied to it become the crux of the fabric. And the flip side to this is what happens to the calculations? What happens to the end user computing? And that's where the whole virtualization technology comes in, is no matter what the end user specifies as their calculation or the, their, the, the formula that they want to see on the report, they are independent from how we are stitching all of this metadata together. So on the screen, in, on their channel, all they're seeing is the same consistent metadata definitions for the type of calculations that they want to do. So there are um, already you know, industry models that are building ontologies like FIBO and WT and so forth. We have also built based on our um, expertise in banking and insurance and so forth, ontologies. And now we are able to curate them and then allow them for sharing, for data sharing, so that through our work with our financial clients, we are able to build onto those network effects, right? And we are able to refine um, the data that we share across the supply chain for our, for our financial services clients. The second area, as I said, was in virtualization and making sure that the advances in virtualization are being captured without, um, without having to redo the virtualization as each technology comes up. So for example, one of the um, um, clients that I work with, they've been using data virtualization across their Hadoop and their data warehouse. But once they adopted the cloud, and now they are adopting two public cloud platforms, that data virtualization technology is not, not just scaling, but it's not adequate to solve for the newer structures and newer metadata that's getting created. So what do they do? Because of the ontology that we built in the, in the prior building block that I just described, they're able to adopt that to front the virtualization layer. Now it doesn't matter if they have a data structure in Hadoop or in the public cloud or in data warehouse, the ontology is the front layer solving for that virtualization. The, the behind the scenes layer is more technical. So the business data layer, as you see here is on, on top, solves for that. And then the behind the scenes data sources are mapped but through the virtualization technology that's already there to the actual sources. So that makes it a lot more easier for clients to adopt um, the, the virtualization technology than just simply only the virtualization. By combining with ontology, they're able to get, make it more powerful. Third, as I said, is using AI for auto mapping. What that means is, a lot of times we get, as an example here, we are able to, we are, we are getting newer and newer source systems. And I'm using pattern detection. I'm using if it's text data, I'm able to use text mining algorithms to convert that text to a more structured data set and determine patterns in that data. Look, map those patterns automatically to ex known data sources and at a minimum come up with probability scopes, right? At a minimum, I'm able to say, hey, this data set that just came in from this new system is 83% similar to this other data set. These are the only differences I see. And this is not, mind you, it's not just a regular expression type of match. We are using intelligence. We are using ontology we built in the previous step to interpret this data. And we are then trying to use mapping techniques to say, using that ontology, that intelligence I got, how does my new data source, my existing data source and the new data source, um, the data distributions compare? And that, as you see here, the benefits of that is clearly you're eliminating, literally eliminating the mapping that we used to do 
20 years ago, when we did ETL work 10 years ago, we would take the resources, we write all the business rules, we code the mapping into the ETL product, and we run the mapper, we schedule it on a specified time. When the mapping finishes, we go and validate that data, make sure it actually reconciles to the source. There's so many steps that happen. Today, because of a more AI-driven, automated ability, we are able to auto-map these, these sources to their targets and cut down the amount of time that it takes to go to market, the amount of time it takes for the users get at the actual refined curated data that they can drive business decisions and insights on. They don't have to wait. Previously, it was taking days at a minimum, weeks, months was normal, six months normal to take a data source, curate it, ETL it, prepare it, put it in the data warehouse, and data scientists to get out the data, build their model, and make that model go into production, and then a decision coming out based on which a client can, a financial institution can, can make a recommendation to their customer. And it was taking an inordinate amount of time. Now we are able to cut that down to minutes, literally minutes, if not faster. And that's the, the power of not just, um, I mean, data fabric whole, but just, just the power of AI, power of ontologies, uh, more rigorous ontologies using AI, um, a part of data sharing and, and so forth. Um, and, and then as, as I've described before, clearly the balance between a powerful role-based access control infused with attribute level. And by attribute, I mean, this just as a simple definition, again, uh, from a context standpoint, from a time standpoint, a geolocation standpoint, that combination is giving me a lot more control over this distribution of data. So the, the chief security officers, the CEOs on, on the CIOs, and they're not afraid of saying, hey, if I do AI-based ontology-driven virtualized platforms, how do I make sure that the end users are getting the data they want, but also those those bad actors are not getting at the data that they want, right? How do I prevent breaches and, and privacy violations? And we are able to combine today with the technology um, using you know, both RBAC and ABAC to make this more effective. Snowflake is a great example where the data platform has some of the role-based access control, but they're now infusing it with attribute-based access control and tied to our native platform like Azure, that we are able to make it more robust than ever before for the end user, for, for us to not only load data and curate it in, in Snowflake, but also share data publicly to our, to our data supply chain, to, to our tenant, to our customers, and to our business partners, and so forth. Um, like I've said before, uh, the semantic governance layer automated controls, right? Whether it is audit balance controls, just making sure regular record counts are mapping or matching from the source to the intermediary layers to the target, to more sophisticated controls in terms of um, data quality controls or you know, regulatory controls. We are able to infuse that into the supply chain without having to um, introduce too many manual processes. And at the same time, making sure that the data pipeline is secure and compliant. And most importantly, to regulators, we're able to provide transparency, right? Not just transparency to say, oh, this metadata field came from this source and it went, it was used in this port, but we are able to do that at the data level, at the data tracing level. We're able to say, where did this data value $205.33 come from. And we are able to show that automatically from the source and all the way through all of the calculations and other functions applied on that on the rack data value. And that makes it a lot more secure and a lot more compliant than we could do ever before. And lastly, as I said earlier on, micro, microservices was the technology that we 
um, this is the approach, right, at a high level. Um, yes, it accelerates delivery and portability. And th this were some of the things we could not do in a few years ago on, on a typical data lake or a data warehouse. But now, um, thanks to the advances, both on the cloud, public cloud platforms, private cloud, we're able to uh, not only make this uh, more loosely coupled, um, and, but also to um, tie them as needed across these different services. And that way, the fabric that you build is actually, it's not yet another new platform, right? So previously it used to be, oh, we build this in an national data store, then we build it in a data warehouse, then you go to a data lake and, and they are just yet another data platform with some slight nuances. But now we are saying it doesn't matter what you have. We can use what you have today and it doesn't matter what you'll get in the future. We are able to tie them together uh, in an in a easy to integrate, integrate manner to APIs and services approach rather than redevelopment of all of this data and moving the data from one place to the other. Um, so with that, as a background, I'll just go over a couple of example use cases that I, that where we are practically implementing this. Um, one example to keep keep it more um, you know more bounded is where we are working with a global banking client. And we have done already one implementation of this using uh, one of the products that we work with that we have an alliance called Stradio, um, a company based out of Spain, and that using that we are able to take the data from a financial institution that's, that is supplying or partnering with one of their business partners and a telco client and able to share data as needed for, that, for the market where that telco client is serving. So we are able to give them financial data. We are able to give them um, that, that is of relevance. We are able to give them um, customer segmentation data, customer insights, food traffic because of COVID, how does that, that telco client deal with certain types of customers? And also the other way around, how does a telco client share data to the financial institution so that the financial institution can reach out to those customers who are suffering because of COVID and say, hey, uh, I understand you have a loan that you're having to pay off, but because of the situation and the pandemic, you are being limited. So we can help you with that. And so you can, we can help you pay your bill to the telco client in a better manner. But that data sharing through the use of the fabric, through the use of business mythology, made a lot more automatic than we could do ever before. And that time that it took for the sharing significantly reduced. And another um, quick example is in terms of um, you know, applying the ABAC, the security. And this is a large global client um, that is having you know, uh, customers in, in different parts of the world. And how do we make sure that the country is taken care of, the country's laws are taken care of, the channels are taken care of, the conditions, like I said, the context matters. The, the, uh, you know, what context and where they are located matters and how we are able to tie those together. So this was a, a solution that we could leverage um, across um, geographies, and across time zones and across um, business groups to build what is called an AI-driven knowledge graph. And, and one single layer that any user interacting with the financial institution is able to tap into and get at the data. And we are using graph-based technology to tie the data to data structures and uh, in a more real-time fashion so that it's available to everybody across the globe in real time. So that's a second type of a use case uh, where we are able to both infuse AI and um, security and provide a consistent view of the business data irrespective of local jurisdiction and, and, and local issues. So with that, um, 
I would say that um, I have gone over some of the building blocks of what a data fabric is. I've shown you a couple of examples. But let me um, stop here and see if there are any questions from anybody. Um, and before I go, I'll go back to the overarching architecture so that if anybody has questions, they can refer to the um, or the, the overall components that make up the data fabric. And while I wait for questions here, um, this uh, as an example, some of the products we use, like I said, Stratio is a, is, is a great product that we've uh, worked with in Spain and, um, and the other two where that I've mentioned during my uh, talk where um, one was uh, Snowflake in terms of data sharing. And we're also uh, working uh, very much with Microsoft Azure and Synapse to uh, help solve some of uh, these um, data fabric uh, oriented technology solutions. Um, so one of the questions I got here, I'm going to just read it out, is the phrase that uh, data is the new oil has not really come to fruition. In your opinion, why is this? So? Yeah, that's the, that's a fabulous question, right? And in a lot of times, I respond to that is while data is may or may not be the new oil, it clearly has become an asset to organizations. So in a way that you can look at the cost of liabilities if they're not managed correctly, if data is not managed correctly, what happens to what kind of liabilities that it exposes the company to? Not just regulatory li liabilities or you know, liabilities that come because of a security breach, not that they're they are lesser, clearly very important, but there are just basic business model liabilities, right? The ability to compete in a fast moving digitally oriented world um, and where your customers, and that's, that is where I started my early part of the presentation today, is the customers switching costs have become far, far lower than they were ever before. So if the customer switches because they say, hey, this other insurance company is giving me a better deal or this other bank is giving me a lower interest rate or better interest rate or a better loan product, I can switch. My cost is to go from one, from one bank to another bank is not as high because I'm able to easily find products. So as a customer, if I'm able to do that, the business is subjected to a liability right away if they don't harness the data in a more in a more efficient, smarter man. So to, to the question is, you know, it's not to a fusion, partly because yes, technology was not at the shape where we could use it as we are now able to talk about it and apply it and actually realize business value. And second, we were beholden to, to ETL products, you know, frankly, for, for many years, we were beholden to data structures that were you know, stuck in a certain time that were not more, more flexible and, and, and easy to scale up. Um, so I hope that um, gives you a little bit picture into why um, it was, it didn't come to fruition in the past, but now we are a lot closer. And in fact, we have been able to realize as I showed you in the use cases, um, more of this as an asset. Um, a second question is, how can financial sector organizations navigate the thin line of using and abusing data? Fantastic question. And, and as I described in terms of um, the privacy controls, right? So thanks to a lot of the legislation that has come out in Europe and in California and so forth. Um, and I think this, is, this becomes, um, now we are working with organizations where we are infusing that as part of their upfront data management strategies so that even institutions that are not subjected to this kind of regulation don't really have to think about it. They are giving a more trustworthy service to their clients, to their customers, right? So customers sharing social media feeds are able to feel that, okay, my privacy is not being invaded, yet this financial institution wants to be my long-term partner through my 
you know, my life and my, you know, personal journey because my data is not going to be breached at all. And they will not, not just breach, but they will not sell me products that exploit my financial situation. And that trust is that comes into the, into the forefront. And that's why we call this the trusted data fabric. So that if that is placed up front, then a customer, more and more customers, stickiness improves with the financial institution. They're able to attract and retain customers over their long term. Um, the third question I've gotten here is um, more and more um, all players know what to do. The challenge is how to do. What are the strategies that you've seen work best? Yeah, that's, that's I mean, that's a technology, that's a great question because Absolutely, I deal with this at IT teams when I go to client, right? So everybody, the IT team says, hey, I know what you're talking about. I know microservices, I know Snowflake, or I know Azure really well, so what, right? So what, what are you bringing to the table? And that's, that's really where the differentiation comes in terms of applying, Based, not just based on strategies that we are seeing across different clients and applying technology um, that is not just realizable, but scalable, but promotable, but adoptable to newer, newer, newer uh, platforms as it's adopted. But also we're able to use the, the strategies where Irrespective, I mean, that, that really becomes, gets to the core of a data fabric. Irrespective of the types of sources on the left-hand side coming into the data supply chain, irrespective of the type of digital channels that your customers are accessing, the method of access, whether it's today a text message from your customer, or is it a video that they're sending because they had a claim, right? They had there was an accident, they, they take a picture, of or a video of what happened um, and something that's affecting them and there's a storm and it's able to send that and they're able to get instant service on claims, instant service on their loans and so forth. That, that basically gets into the heart of what a data fabric is in terms of the newer sources, newer data structures, and yet that is independence from a data management standpoint to deal with those those newer you know, structures and sources and able to integrate them into the business model, right? In the end, no matter what the technology is, if we cannot integrate it into the actual strategic business model of that institution, none of this matters. So it's that ability to use automated intelligent methods and assets around, it, around that to integrate into the business model that really plays a part and helping that business model grow, right? So, so um, that's that. And, and then um, I'll take a couple more here. Um, even now, data is siloed in most financial institutions. How to foster a culture of openness and collaboration around data? I mean, that's, that's, that's a great question because um, if, if we take an example like I have on the screen here, we have, let's take silos, right? So we have on, on public cloud, let's say we go on to Azure and we are putting data in Azure SQL DB, we put data into Azure Cosmos. Um, we also have data on premise systems. Right away there are silos, right? And how do we make sure that those silos are broken? And what we found very effective is measured data holds the key to success, right? This is, and that, that seems like, oh, that's such a cliche statement. But for the past few years, we were able to use the AI-based ontologies and drive metadata growth through the knowledge graphs and through you know, graph-based technology to make that, that semantic layer consistent and trustworthy. And that made users always go to the semantic layer for data access to say, hey, I want to get at this data. Where is it exactly? What does it mean? And it's this one consistent layer that serves business users across the organization. And it's through that metadata, through that ontology, 
an, an existent update of the ontology that makes um, the, the helps break down those um, silos. Um, and lastly, I think another question here, um, would you share your thoughts on data decentralization? It's happening in several domains and what is the impact on data? So when you look at that, yes, data is not only getting decentralized, it's getting demonetized, right? It's getting cheaper. And it's also getting, um, like when you say decentralized, it's getting democratized. It's, it's people are able to use in several domains across. And that's where the, from a fabric standpoint, we are able to say, provide data, context data at the time of need to the type of service that's needed, but also anticipate what is needed at the time of service, right? And it's, it is that, that fuel that says, okay, at this time, I'm able to interact with this data and getting it for, um, for, for much cheaper than I could get it before because ease of access is so much faster, scale is so much better, performance is so much better, but I'm also getting a recommendation. I'm also getting what else I should do, what, you know, and because it's anticipating what I should be doing. And I'm able to refine that anticipation and feed my internal system, my data fabric, so that the next time I serve a client or a customer, I have the context and I'm able to serve better. So that is helping me to improve service. Um, I, I have one more question here. The perceived level of data exploitation in LATAM, how far close are financial sector uh, players from the best in class? Now that's, that's a great question. And the reason I'd say it's not just about LATAM, it's, we see that across the board, right? It, it doesn't matter whether it's in North America, it's in LATAM, it's in Asia and so forth. We've always found that a lot of the traditional financial services companies have stayed a one step you know, behind the digitally growing companies, right? And you take the Googles and the Microsofts and so forth. Um, and they're always looking, say, because they're tied down by regulations, they're tied down by um, the FinTech's more agile way of delivering. Um, yes, and they are tied down by their their own investments in large scale monolithic type of platforms. But today we are seeing that some of these financial institutions, um, a huge Wall Street firm, for example, um, has determined that that doesn't cut it anymore. And they are able to build new platforms from scratch on the cloud or using public private cloud, hybrid cloud platforms to then say, we can be as competitive or if not better than the so-called digital um, fans who have grown up on that business model. That they are now able to tie up or to offer services just as other digital companies are able to offer. And that's making this a lot more agile. Um, this we are not only in financial institutions, we are seeing this in insurance, we are seeing this in financial advice and wealth management. Um, and so I think that's where the, the point about network effects comes in, is you're, you're taking, you're having a data platform powered by AI, powered by data sharing technology, but also using a, you know, uh, modern and ontology-based methods to share data across the supply chain. And that's making the traditional institutions a lot more agile, and that is across the board. So with that, um, I thank you all for the questions. Um, sorry if I didn't get to any other questions, but I think I've covered them all. And I thank you all for um, listening to this presentation. Greatly appreciate your time. Have a great day.